In my final year as an undergraduate at Oxford, I went for an interview in one of the most famous research institutes in the world, the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. It was an exciting moment, and as I walked through the entrance, I saw a Latin inscription that was carved into the doors. A hundred years earlier, uh, a Cambridge parish priest had gone to call on uh, a bedridden parishioner who was, as it happens, the man responsible for that inscription. The man was suffering from advanced stomach cancer and would in fact die a couple of days later. He'd had a bad night and the uh, the priest who had gone to bring communion didn't expect there to be any conversation. But as he robed himself to administer the sacrament, he heard a voice from the bed with a, a slight trace of a Galloway accent, reciting from memory all five verses of George Herbert's poem about the robing of Aaron. Holiness on the head. Light and perfection on the breast. Thus are true Aaron's dressed. <laughs> Was that a slight Galloway accent? Oh, yeah, I'm doing my best, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> What the priest didn't know and didn't discover was that the man on the bed had changed the world. Fifteen years earlier, in what Richard Feynman described as the most significant event of the 19th century, he had written down four equations which not only describe a fundamental characteristic of the universe, but provide the basis for every electronic technology in the world today. What the priest did discover was that his parishioner seemed to know pretty well the entire Bible by heart and that the inscription over the door of the laboratory had been inspired by a deep faith. The laboratory at Cambridge was one of the first purpose-built general scientific institutes in an English university, but not the first. The building you're sitting in this evening was earlier. At about the same time that Andrew started work at the Cavendish, I was an undergraduate about to head off to art school, and as you heard in the film, I became fascinated with this building. Its designers intended it to be the first building since the medieval cathedrals, where craftsmen and sculptors and artisans were allowed a free hand, and the relief over the entrance which shows an angel holding a book in one hand and three germ cells in the other, was intended to symbolize the unity between art and science and religion. The story of that sculpture and of the inscription at Cambridge inspired for both of us a 16-year intellectual journey. How, we asked each other, were the motivations of the religious invocations on the outside of those buildings related to the motivations of the scientific investigations that went on inside. For more than two centuries now, historians of science have been interested in the complex connections between science and religion. What we now call science and religion have obviously changed and developed over, over history. And it's hard to establish straightforward causal connections between these two different kinds of changes. Nevertheless, there have been correlations, and it seems unlikely to be mere coincidence that important changes in both science and in religion on several key occasions have occurred at pretty well the same time. Scientists like me who experimentally investigate the nature of quantum reality are interested in the way that particles like uh, electrons or photons can be correlated even though they might be at opposite ends of the universe. It's called quantum entanglement. And you might in a similar way describe the connection between religion and science as a kind of entanglement. But what was the nature of that entanglement? Artists like me who tackle religious subjects are often interested in finding connections between the sublimity and fascination of the universe around us uh, and the internal human perspective that seems to constantly urge us to reach out beyond the horizon of the visible universe. In fact, the, the impulses that drove human beings to first create images of the visible world seem to have been religious. The first clear evidence of religious behaviour and the emergence of what paleontologists call homo religiosus 
goes back to some burials about 90,000 years ago, but a new kind of evidence is expressed in the earliest cave paintings, which appeared about 40,000 years ago. One reason that it made sense for an artist and a scientist to try to think about this together is that we can see a deep connection between behaviour that appears to be religiously inspired and a curiosity about the natural world. We know that Paleolithic people didn't live in the deep caves where they made these images, which seem to have been used for some kinds of religious ceremonies. What is evident, though, from the great painted complexes of Altamira and Lascaux and Chauvet uh, is that the, the people who produced them seem to have invested a vast amount of human resources, of time and energy in, in their creation. And throughout history, human communities have continued to invest enormous resources in religious artefacts and constructions. From Altamira to ziggurats, from the pyramids to Stonehenge, from caves to cathedrals. We may have very different opinions about why they have invested so much time and energy in such things, but we can all agree that they have. It seems unlikely that prehistoric communities would devote resources to observing and studying the natural world simply for the sake of it. But could such observations be stimulated and carried along by the kind of motivation which led people to make these images deep underground. You could think of it as being like a slipstream. When geese fly in a V formation, or Tour de France cyclists form a peloton, those behind don't have to work as hard as those in front. They get a free ride in the slipstream. Whatever the exact motivation of the people who made these paintings, we can be fairly sure that they didn't set out to investigate the anatomy of a horse. Yet with each successive image, the painter who drew these pictures corrected themselves through a possibly unconscious experimental process of trial and error. He or she produced a series that progressively becomes more anatomically correct until finally they end up with an image that Leonardo wouldn't be ashamed of. As far as we know, that image didn't produce a whole new style of cave painting. The slipstream of religious motivation may not have been strong enough for that. But when agriculture came on the scene and settled societies developed with forms of writing, a whole series of organized religions began to appear all over the world, in China, in India, in the Middle East and in the Americas. And tucked in behind them are developments in astronomy, in medicine, in mathematics and chemistry, enjoying, as it were, a free ride in those more powerful slipstreams. Why do geese fly in a V formation? Why do Tour de France riders stay within inches of the rider in front? The answer is that certain configurations not only reduce the wind resistance, but can actually create an energetic advantage from a vortex. So are there parallels to these kind of special configurations in the development of religions which have created equivalence to this kind of energetic advantage? In the Greek colony of Miletus in the 6th century BC, the idea began to develop that there might be a single divine principle, what they called arche, behind everything that we see. There was vigorous debate about how to describe it, but now instead of thinking of earthquakes as Poseidon shaking the ground or the sun as Helios riding his chariot, the idea of one divine rational principle behind everything began to make room for a new kind of curiosity about the physical world. You might call it a penultimate curiosity. And as the idea of a single divine principle began to take hold, so travelling in its slipstream, this new kind of penultimate curiosity about the physical world accelerates. And they're off. Plato and his followers begin to apply geometry to the motion of the planets. Aristotle sets up his Lyceum as a kind of research institute where his disciples study every aspect of the physical world. And using that model, the library in the Museum at Alexandria is established as a research facility for scholars throughout the Hellenistic world. With the coming of Islam, Muslim scholars emphasize that Allah, who creates everything, is the source of all truth, so that truth must be sought for and embraced in whatever culture it can be found. In the slipstream of that idea, a massive translation movement has begun in the 10th century. The House of Wisdom is established in Baghdad 
and astronomical observatories are built throughout the Muslim world. Outside the Muslim world, these ideas are picked up in the West in the 12th century and developed in the new Christian universities, where following up the idea of a divine lawgiver, scholars and theologians begin to search for mathematical laws underlying physical phenomena and to use what they begin to call experimental science to study the world. When new technologies come online, when telescopes and microscopes begin to open up the depth of the universe and the world of the small, and printing enables the rapid transfer of information, the speed increases. When Luther and others set out to democratize the reading of God's word, later Reformation thinkers like Francis Bacon apply this to the reading of God's works suggesting it needs to be a joint enterprise in which all conditions of people have a part. And now we're piling on speed. In Oxford and elsewhere in the 17th century, groups of experimenters, astronomers and mathematicians begin to come together and collaborate. The Royal Society is founded and its transactions are published. Isaac Newton, in his Principia Mathematica, describes a law-like universe. The most beautiful system of the sun and the planets which could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. And suddenly we're flying. Laws of nature are looked for everywhere. How much more simple and sublime, says Darwin, if God says, let animals be created by fixed laws of generation. Universities begin to put Andrew, up buildings like... Andrew, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, Excuse me. but this is all very comfortable. What about the conflicts between science and religion? Ah, OK. Uh, Colin, that's a good question. So, for those who didn't hear, Professor Blakemore is asking what about the conflicts between science and religion, which is a good question, but what do you think, Roger? Should we take that at the end afterwards? Or, or uh, well. And so we are going to have um, uh, time for questions at the end, but I think actually we, we could address that um, by thinking of, um, of what happens in a, a slipstream and uh, going back to that idea of, uh, of the Tour de France and uh, what happens there when things uh, sort of begin to go wrong. Uh, you want me to, uh, Well, all right. Uh, well, it works like this. The, the drag on the lead cyclist increases with speed, and to maximise the benefit... The, the one behind must uh, cycle as close as possible, sometimes actually within centimetres of the leader. So that, um, so what happens is um, uh, when, when wheels clash, uh, it's obviously a disaster, everyone falls down, you get the, the shoot, the, um, the, the pile-ups that are very much a, a characteristic uh, of that race. Yes, and, and so I suppose when... Um, science really starts travelling in the slipstream of religion, the temptation to close the gap, to, to try to make um, science answer religious questions and vice versa, can become very strong. And the clash of ideas that results can produce a, a kind of a pile-up, a sort of a shoot, in which everyone falls over. So um, if, we, if we could go back um, and, and run the story our, our other way. <laughs> so. They're off again, and uh, Plato seizes on the idea that the planets move in perfect geometrical circles around the Earth to prove the rationality of the universe. Epicurus denies the validity of research that doesn't lead to peace of mind. Right explanations are dismissed. Wrong explanations are set in stone. And they're down. Fast forward 2,000 years, and the idea seized on by Plato and developed by Ptolemy has now been accepted by most astronomers. So when a canon at Frombork Cathedral called Nicholas Copernicus produces a model with the sun at its centre and a Catholic layman called Galileo Galilei produces an argument... Though not observational proof. ...that, that Copernicus is right, religious authority is used to stifle dissent. Alternative explanations are suppressed. Wrong explanations are set in stone. And they're down again. A century later, Newton's Principia is taken by materialists as a proof of materialism and by theists as a proof for natural theology. The weaponization of science in the battle for intellectual credibility produces a stalemate which is followed by the beginning of a romantic repudiation of science. And it's a shoot. And they're down. And now we're in the 19th century and attempts to prove God does or doesn't exist move from physics to biology. 
William Paley's natural theology finds evidence for God in everything from the hinge of a bivalve to the epiglottis of an alderman. Why an alderman? <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Um, and <laughs> uh, Darwin's theory of evolution, of course, is used by secularists to discredit the book of Genesis. The idea of intelligent design may not be amenable to scientific investigation, but it's perfectly adapted to popular philosophical controversy. <laughs> and they're down, it's a shoot, it's a massive pile-up. And of course, in the Tour de France, whenever this happens, uh, the race is cancelled and everyone goes home. Uh, actually, Roger, I don't think that is what happens. <laughs> no. <laughs> According to the instructions, race marshals should try to prevent falls in the first place by blowing whistles and waving flags to warn of tricky conditions. When falls happen, in most cases, the cyclists get back on their bikes. The marshal's job is then to move aside bicycles that are obstructing the route. So are there people in history who have acted, as it were, like race marshals, warning of tricky conditions uh, and clearing away obstructions? Let's run the story one final time, focusing not on slipstreams or shoots, but on a few of the people who've taken on this marshalling role warning against hazards in the relationship between science and religion, and showing how these two different forms of curiosity may most fruitfully work together. And somewhere near the beginning of the route, our first race marshal is John Philoponus, the Christian philosopher who in this recently discovered pagan philosophical school in 6th century Alexandria, warned his fellow believers that the purpose of the scriptures was to reveal the fact of God's creation, but not how it came about. And who tried to demonstrate to his pagan philosophical colleagues that the idea that the heavens were eternal and made of a divine substance was ill-founded. His slogan was, let nothing in any manner get in the way of truth. 300 years down the track as it winds through 9th century Baghdad is our next marshal, Abu Yasuf Yaqub al-Kindi a man described as the philosopher of the Arabs. Who promoted the adoption of Indian numerals by the Arabs and wrote that we must not be ashamed to admire the truth or acquire it from wherever it may be found, even if it should come from far-flung nations and foreign peoples. All are ennobled by it. Another 400 years on, as the route comes now through 13th century Oxford, is Robert Grosseteste, in effect the first chancellor of the university before becoming Bishop of Lincoln. He translated Aristotle and wrote one of the first Latin commentaries on his works. Grosseteste argued that Christians shouldn't pointlessly try to make a Christian out of Aristotle, but should learn from his method of arriving at the truth. He was one of the first people to outline the methodology of what we would describe as a controlled experiment. He went on to do pioneering work on the geometry of light that inspired Roger Bacon. And staying in Oxford, but moving on another 400 years as we come past Wadham College, here is Warden John Wilkins, later Bishop of Chester. Who, eight years after the condemnation of Galileo, brought out a book in which Copernicus, Galileo, uh, with Kepler peering over his shoulder, appear as the heroes of his title page. And now staying in Oxford, but coming into the final straight, is Henry Ackland, doctor and Regis Professor of Medicine, who was the friend of art critic John Ruskin, studied with the painter Samuel Palmer, uh, and is, for that reason, my personal hero. Ackland championed scientific medicine. He became a passionate advocate of public health and led the movement for developing science within the university. He won theologians to the cause of science and campaigned to award Darwin an honorary degree. He saw religion, science and art as complementary endeavours and brought them together in this museum that he campaigned for here in Parks Road. If you seek his monument, look around you.
Finally, travelling to Cambridge, we arrive back where we started with the patient on the bed, who many of you will have recognised as James Clark Maxwell. The Latin inscription which Maxwell had carved over the doors of the Cavendish Laboratory was a, a quotation from Psalm 111. As a graduate student, I suggested that Maxwell's quotation should be placed over the new Cavendish entrance, and now in English. Somewhat to the surprise of the head of department, the policy committee enthusiastically agreed to this. It reads, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. While Maxwell thought that Christians whose minds were scientific should approach their work in this spirit, he was equally clear that because science is always changing, it's a mistake to look for a static harmony between science and religion. Don't confuse penultimate curiosity with the ultimate kind. Move in the slipstream, but don't let the wheels touch. As a young man, Maxwell wrote a reflection expressing the aspiration that his working life should, as far as possible, be integrated with his ethical and spiritual identity. Happy is the man who can see in the work of today a connected portion of the work of life. And an embodiment of the work of eternity. And that's an aspiration which is as valid for an artist as it is for a scientist. Thank you.